a prayer to you at a time of distress the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them so let's pray together in Jesus name for our concerns and our joys and let us continue in prayer Almighty God, our loving Father, we pray that the love that passes ceaselessly between the Father and the Son in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit may renew and deepen the life of each Christian and draw us all gathered here into your unending life. God of all mercies, we pray for the leaders of the church and for the leaders of nations that they may discern ways to overcome divisions and mistrust and may reflect your unity in every aspect of common life. We pray for our families, our households, and our communities, that they may be places of communion and mutual support, which build us up and strengthen us in grace and truth. O God, we are thankful for our world that you made through Christ and renewed in the power of the resurrection. May we be wise and careful stewards of that creation. And in the power of the Spirit who joins our prayers to Christ's enduring intercession, we pray for the sick, the suffering, and all who stand in need. We pray especially today for Austin and Jess, our sister church in Skagway, and first responders in our community. We pray for healing for David Land, June Haas, Wendell Miller, Cecilia David, Tammy, Annette, Nancy, Martha, John, We pray for missionaries in Haiti who have been kidnapped and must be enduring a terrible time of fear. We pray that you'd strengthen them and hold them up. Give them faith and uh, endurance in their time of need. Protect them. And Lord, we pray for their captors that they might see the light of Christ in the captives they have taken and that their lives would be transformed by your love. We continue to pray for those in our community who are recovering from last winter's flooding and landslide. This is a long-term recovery, and we are persisting in prayer to you, Lord, that you will not only restore their homes and, and our community, but our very lives and souls knowing that you have taken care of us and and you will continue to hold us in your hand. And we pray today for Travis and Dakota, for the excitement of a wedding day, and Lord, we pray for a good, solid marriage for them with you at the center of their home. And uh, just pray your, your presence with them today and your protection as they travel for uh a little wedding trip, and then back home to Haynes. Gracious God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father, accept our prayers this day. By the inner workings of your Spirit, deepen our communion with you, the source and goal of our life, and make us more and more signs of your enduring love. This we pray through Christ, who taught us to pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
The Old Testament reading for this morning comes from Genesis, and the New Testament reading will come from Romans. But before we read God's Word, would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, who caused all Scripture to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them this morning, to learn them and digest them, that we may embrace and hold fast to the hope of everlasting life which you have given us in Jesus Christ. And may your Holy Spirit dwell with Dana today as he proclaims your word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. The Old Testament reading is taken from Genesis chapter 25, verses 21 through 34. Listen now for the word of God. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife, because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out, with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up. And Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, First, sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. And the passage from Romans is taken from Romans 7, verses 13 to 25. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. <clears throat> but in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do. This is what I keep on doing." Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members." What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law. But in the sinful nature, 
a slave to the law of sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, congregation. I, uh, when I'm playing guitar and singing, I like to look out at you, but sometimes when I do, I get choked up because you're praising the Lord, and it means a lot to me. I appreciate being in your presence. Thanks for the children's sermon, Al. Uh, when you come to my house and do it, I like dark chocolate. <laughs> so thank you. I would preach like that, but I don't have the gifts. Okay, so... Uh, I have to tell you a conversation I had on the telephone with an airline company. I had some credit because I had to cancel a ticket, and instead of putting the money back on my card, they said, oh, you can have credit, but it's not an airline that flies out of Juneau, and, you know, when am I going to use it? So I thought, okay, well, when I'm flying my daughter to Oregon for Thanksgiving, I'll use this airline credit, $116 of credit, and it'll only cost me $50 to redeem it. What a deal. So I get on the phone to get my $76, and I give them all the information, the flight number and all that, and credit card, shazam, we're done. And then I realize, oh, I didn't tell you who the traveler is. It's my daughter, Madeline. Oh, I'm sorry. It'll cost you $50 to change that. So now I got, I was trying to get, you know, redeem $116, and now I'm $350 in the hole. I started 116 in the hole. I said, no, 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 no. I am not one of the people that always demands to talk to the manager, but I was like, no, please, this can't happen. He said, okay, I'll talk to my boss. Now, today we're going to talk about self-control, the final fruit in the list, and what you're hopefully going to receive out of the sermon today is that in order to avoid paying the cost of the sin, the cost of losing your birthright, you're going to need to talk to the manager. You're going to need a higher authority, a higher power to step in and say, uh, no, that doesn't have to be the case. And so Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. It turns out it was beans. (laughs) You, You think of this wonderful savory soup and it's just lentils. He's a hunter and he's going to throw it all away for lentils. Uh... And, you know, in this story, we've got Jacob and Esau, and Esau had the birthright. He was the older boy. And in ancient Middle Eastern culture, the oldest male had this responsibility and privilege. When the father died, the patriarch died, the eldest son would suddenly become the boss of the family, the manager, the ruler. And that person had the authority, uh, not just sentimental authority, positional power to decide what would happen with the family. We're going from here to there, everybody. So when Jacob was among the tents, it was the tents of everyone in that household. And uh, Isaac was the patriarch. So Esau had a birthright that would give him authority. It would give him a double portion of the wealth when the father died. And it would also give him this special position with God, special relationship with God. Because in that time and in that context of the genesis of God's people, God was dealing with the patriarch of the family in a special way. Abraham, Isaac, and then it would be Jacob instead of Esau. This is the birthright that you have. The scripture tells us that in Christ, you are an inheriting child. And don't be offended by the language, but you're called the eldest son in the sense that you're the inheriting child. You have the the birthright. You have the authority in Christ. You share in Christ's authority. You have the wealth, the riches, the riches of relationship with God, the spiritual riches in heaven, being treasured by God and having the treasure of God. And you have a special relationship through Christ, access to, fa- to the Father, and God working out his plan through you, the way that God was working out his plan through those families in the book of Genesis. We also have our bowl of soup. We have our lentil list. We have the things that can trigger us and trick us and trap us into trading something temporary in for something permanent. Now, I'm not going to tell you that if you sin, you won't go to heaven. But if I did, if I were to tell you, if you commit these sins, you're losing your birthright. 
You'll not go to heaven. You'll not enter the kingdom. If I were to preach that to you, God would use it to make you go to heaven. <laughs> so whether I preach it right or not, God's going to use this warning for you for your eternal salvation. But the Bible is putting before us this picture, this image of choosing something temporary and forsaking something eternal or saying, no, I'm going to suffer and I'll take what's eternal. I'll suffer by not receiving the temporary pleasure and instead I'll take what's eternal. I've always felt sorry for Esau. There, I'm a person who gets hungry. I, you know, I, I, I like good gas mileage in my car and bas, bad gas mileage in me. I like to, you know, have a high metabolism and just always need to eat. I love that. But I don't like it when my car always needs to eat. But, you know, it's a good thing with me. But I, I, I have a high metabolism. And I get so hungry, I want to rip the sleeves off my shirt and eat them. I just get so hungry. And I can imagine how Esau felt after being out in the open country. Uh, sometimes when I don't want to look at the time when I'm fishing, I'll just use my stomach as a gauge. I know if I actually feel hungry, I really, really am. So uh, we have these cravings and desires that will satisfy the temporary need of our body, of our human nature, but they are against the eternal need of relationship with God. We all have our own little lentil list. Uh, on my list is prime fishing, but on somebody else's list is Amazon Prime. <laughs> on my list is putting things off until later. On somebody else's list is being put off, easily offended. On my list is pride in my humble circumstances or formerly humble circumstances. I've never had a new car and neither has my family growing up. On somebody else's list is pride in someone else's humble circumstances. I've got a new car and they don't. Uh, we all have our little lentil list, things that uh, trigger sins, things that we want to uh, satisfy our ego or the hunger of our flesh and we're trading in a, a mentality a mindset or a practice that's related to eternal life for a quick fix for quick relief the reason we have these desires and these triggers is because we live in a body of death now i believe i mentioned last week that our position is in heaven that in christ we're the bright shiny 64 impala we're all bright and shiny in heaven. In Christ, we are just perfect as Jesus is our mediator interceding for us. And he took human flesh up to the right hand of the Father, and we are seated with Christ in heavenly realms. But in the nitty-gritty everyday life, uh, it's not always so perfect. When we bonk our head on something, we kind of want to cuss. I don't know, maybe that's just me. Maybe that's a testosterone thing. But maybe when you hear a juicy little gossip, we kind of want to talk too. Or we hear a joke, we kind of want to laugh to make someone feel comfortable. There's all kinds of ways that this human nature inside us wants to lean over and fall off the log in the direction of sin because we have a body of death a body that is leaning towards sin. And when we're talking about body, we're talking about the way the brain works. If uh, you were uh, slapped a lot randomly as a kid, when somebody raises their hand, you might flinch. That's because in your brain is a big wrinkle from what happened to you in your formative years. That's the body we live in. It develops these patterns. I'll, I'll demonstrate how this works, okay? First, I need to ask you a few questions. Uh, what's the name of that fabric? that's produced by the little caterpillars that make that little thread. What's that called? Silk. Silk, okay. And what's that fabric that was traded in ancient China along that road? Uh, that, what was it? Okay. And when you go to Nordstrom's to buy a tie for that special man in your life, it's a fancy tie. What's it made out of? Okay, so let's say, say that three times really fast. Silk, silk, silk. What does a cow drink? Ah, okay, good. <laughs> Water, milk. Somebody's, you know, read my notes. This is not your first rodeo. All right, we have a tendency to say milk because we associate cow and milk, and we just said silk three times. I mean, that's the body. We've got these patterns in our brain. Our body includes our brain, and, and sometimes we just have sinful patterns. Uh, we have addictions. We have triggers. We have cycles of defeat. 
I, last night, while I was cleaning the kitchen and looking for that last-minute sermon illustration, I put on a TED Talk. And I was so tickled because the thesis of the TED Talk was one of the things I wrote early in my sermon notes. The art, uh, self-control is the art of being comfortable with discomfort. I wrote that in my notes before I listened to this TED Talk. And then this man, a researcher in Seattle, talked about his research and the work that he does. He'll take a group of people and he'll help them to overcome addiction like cigarettes or a, a food addiction, things that are related to health. He works with the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. His research lab is there. So he's do, dealing with health. And he had a woman that came in, a client, and uh, she needed to quit smoking. So he said to her, you know, uh, what, what are you experiencing in terms of cravings? She said, I never crave cigarettes. That's because she was just smoking them all the time. She never thought about it. She'd get up in the morning, smoke a cigarette, and work a couple hours, take a break, smoke a cigarette. She didn't have to think about it. It was just automatic. He said, so this is what you do. You get your journal, and every time you feel the urge to smoke a cigarette, you write it in your journal. That's all you have to do this week until we meet again. And she said, Doc, when, when, when she came to him the next time, Doc, you wrecked me. You ruined me because I never had any cravings for cigarettes. And now all day long, I'm craving cigarettes because she wrote it in her journal, craving now, 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 now. He said, good, good. You're on your way. Now, the next thing you do next week, uh, whenever you notice the craving, you, you just embrace it and rest in it. Just notice and say, it's okay to have this craving. Because what was happening is she'd crave the cigarettes, she'd smoke it, and then she'd feel ashamed because she knew she wasn't supposed to do that because she's supposed to live a full lifespan. So she, she'd feel ashamed, then she'd feel bad, and then the way to not feel bad anymore is smoke a cigarette. <laughs> so he said, it's okay to feel bad. It's okay to be comfortable with your discomfort. You just write in your journal the craving that you have and just rest in that discomfort. And as you learn to become comfortable with the discomfort, you find that you don't have to satisfy the cravings anymore. This is all biblical. This is what Paul is talking about. This is what the 12-step program is talking about. Alcoholics Anonymous is a Bible-based program. In fact, when I was a student at the University of Oregon, there was talk in the paper and talk going around about trying to kick AA off a of campus at U of O because it was Christian and it was secretly proselytizing, proselytizing people and making them Christians. We couldn't have that at the University of Oregon. So they were going to kick AA off so that it would help everybody or whatever. So the reason the, the University of Oregon rightly understood that this AA is a Christian program is that it was started by a Christian. I think it was a pastor. I forgot to re look that up and confirm. But it's all based on the gospel. It's based uh, on confessing sin and repenting. Uh, I go to, if I were to go to AA, I'd say, my name is Dana, and I'm an alcoholic. I have a craving to smoke. I have a craving. I live in a body of death. Paul is having this conversation because he's uh, explaining to the Romans how the law works and why Christians aren't under the Old Testament law. He's talking about the law uh, shows us that we desire sin. We have a compulsion and a craving for sin. And the only way to be set free is to be a slave of righteousness instead of a slave of sin. You're going to be a slave one way or another. You're going to wait on that phone and you're either going to cave in and say, oh, I'll pay the $350. Or you're going to say, no, I'm going to call on a higher power. And I'm going to just sit in this discomfort of not knowing what's going to happen. And I'm going to wait until the manager speaks. The 12-step program says you call on a higher power. You wait. You are comfortable with the discomfort. You say, I'm an alcoholic. And that's what self-control is about in the scriptures. It's uh, saying there's this bowl of soup. And if Esau would have loved his birthright instead of despising it, he would have had to sit there and wait. And Jacob said, mmm, this is so good. Bring it over. Oh, fresh made. It's creamy. It's lentily. I've got bread. <laughs> Very good for you. And he'd have to wait and wait and wait until he could make his own darn soup. And so self-control is the art of being comfortable with the discomfort. We have to wait. We have to be a slave to righteousness instead of a slave to sin. We have to have a higher power, a higher authority. And when Paul says, I live in a body of death, even after he raised people from the dead, 
Even after he was bit by a deadly snake and shook it off into the fire, even after he was left for dead and got up and walked away, miracles and preaching in front of the most powerful person in the world. He's a man who preached in front of Caesar all the things that Paul did. He still said, I have a body of death. And when he concludes that conversation, he says, praise be to God because I have self-control. Actually, he didn't say that. Now, the Greek word for self-control means dominion, and it's a compound word. One word means dominion. The other word means sphere or, you know, circle. So dominion around your bubble. I have dominion over me. That's self-control in the Greek understanding. Plato had this idea and this virtue, and it led to a whole school of thought in Greek culture that you would be really hard on your body. You would... And deny yourself every pleasure any desire your body had you had to show that you were stronger than that pleasure This is a real common mindset in our culture, too You have willpower and the strength to uh, Meet your fitness goals or whatever it is That's not the biblical concept. That's not what is being offered to us. What's being offered to us is Jesus dominion It's a dominion from within but it comes from the Holy Spirit when Paul ends this conversation about uh, doing what he doesn't want to do and not doing what he wants to do, not having the power to overcome this lentil stew, this, uh, the, the, the lure of sin. He doesn't say, praise be to God because I've got self-control. He says, praise be to God for Jesus Christ who redeems me, my deliverer. Jesus, my deliverer. Now, this is how Jesus delivers you. It's already and not yet. It's a two-part thing. That the already not yet is our entire life in Christ. We're already shiny in heaven, and yet we still have some sandblasting we're experiencing. You know, we still have to wait and deal with some discomfort. And Jesus saves us right now, today, right in this moment and right after church, because he has the power. He has the power. When you come to him and say, Jesus, I can't quit. I can't stop gossiping. I can't stop hating. I can't forgive I can't quit cigarettes. I can't stop drinking. But I believe you. And I know you have the power. You can do it. He does. And he just has to say a word. He can give you the power. It can change you. It has happened. There are people here, right? People here have been delivered from different kinds of addictions. Jesus has the power today. And in your life, he can deliver you. Praise God. It's not self-control, it's because you're so great. It's waiting on the manager, and he comes in with a different, a different story. So you don't have to pay that high price. But there's something even better, because you know what? When you get free from cigarettes or from alcohol, you're going to find something else. Ah, shoot, I keep doing that. <laughs> I keep doing that. I keep fishing a half an hour too long. <laughs> I keep saying yes when I should say maybe not. I keep saying maybe not when I should say yes. I keep letting this person run me over. I keep running this person over. I keep saying bad things when I should say good things. You know, we're changing from glory to glory because when you overcome one bowl of soup, the next one shows up. And it was there all along. It's just that the Holy Spirit reveals what you've been caving into and says now it's time to overcome this. So you're changing from glory to glory, becoming more and more holy, and it's going to happen until one of two things happen. There'll be a shout, the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet, and Jesus will rip the sky. And he says, now is the time. I'm here. And the body that you're sitting in right now will become forever young, forever healthy, forever clean, forever happy. And you'll be in your resurrection body because Jesus just tore the sky open. Or you're going to die, like me. You know, one of those two things will happen. We'll die young, we'll die old, we'll die happy, we'll die sad. We'll, we're going to die, or Jesus is going to tear the sky apart and get here. But one way or another, we're going to have a new body that doesn't act like a body of death anymore. Doesn't remember the times we were slapped. It doesn't remember the habits that we've had. It doesn't ever want to talk somebody down or talk yourself up. It just doesn't, it's over it. It's a new body, a glorious body. And we have that because Jesus took this kind of body and he put it on the cross. He was crucified for us. And then with those scars, he was 
elevated and is at the right hand of the Father right now interceding for us. Because of that, we have both kinds of redemption, both kinds of salvation for us. Something that will help you today and something that's guaranteed forever solve the problem of self-control. So, here's the one thing to remember from the sermon today. Be comfortable with discomfort. There's your memory line. Be comfortable with discomfort. When you're triggered, when you don't be ashamed that you're tempted. That's the first thing the Holy Spirit had on Jesus' list. Go get tempted. Don't be ashamed of yourself when you're tempted. Just notice it. Write it in your journal. And be uncomfortable while you wait and don't give and eat this. Don't give in. Don't eat the soup. Just embrace that discomfort. Be comfortable with discomfort. That's what you remember. Here's what you do. All right. Here's this is a gimmicky little practice. And I know that these work because I've used one for myself. Once a, a teacher, a Holy Spirit teacher, like the one we had at our renewal weekend, was talking to me in Iowa. And I got from that lesson that any time a thought comes into my mind that I just know is wrong, I don't want it there. I say unclean thought, I take you captive and make you obedient to Christ. I'd do it a hundred times a day if I have to. I don't get ashamed that I had that thought. I don't beat myself up. No, I just say unclean thought, I take you captive. All right, that has helped me. And hopefully this will help you. This is what you do. Say, I will inherit. Let's say that together. I will inherit. Amen. Just rest in that discomfort. You don't need that soup. You don't have to do it. You don't have to pay the high price. You will inherit authority, riches, the love of God. I will inherit. May God give us grace so that we're a radiant church, a radiant church. Amen.